So, you know, I was thinking uh, about that purse snatcher video that we've got to do where it's like the whole justification for the NSA spying domestically is the purse snatching case from the 70s. Yeah, the Smith and uh, Maryland case, right? Yeah, but it's not really even about that. There's something deeper and more sinister going on with that. Like what? Well, it's really a war on dissent. They don't like dissent. They don't like dissent? This, is, this game's awesome. No, no, not the game. I, I don't even really like the game. You don't like the game? All nerds like this game. You're not allowed to dislike this game. That's exactly what I'm talking about. So we promised everybody a video on Smith versus Maryland. Now, Smith versus Maryland is the case that a lot of people reference when they're in court and they're trying to justify their warrantless wiretapping and them being the NSA, the intelligence community, etc., the U.S. government, the Department of Justice. They're spying on all of us, and they keep using this same case. Now, here's what happened in that case. We'll give you like a... 17 second version. Smith stole a purse from a girl and then he started, he became obsessed and kept calling and calling and calling her. So he, so the girl called the police and said, this guy is harassing me. Well, the police realized that they couldn't just go out and get a wiretap without a warrant, but they decided, well, you know, we can call the phone company and just see how many times he calls you. This case went to court because, you know, Smith was like, these guys are invading my privacy. And then the court said, you know what? You're calling and you're going through the business, which is the, um, like, you know, whatever the phone carrier. And you have no right to think that that's going to be private. The you know the conversation was private, but every time he called, you know the he, number he showed had, up. He had to give the number to the phone company in order to complete the call. So he had no right to expect privacy. Right, and so from that, this person calling this other person to harass them, they were able to then get a warrant but they wouldn't have been able to determine that this individual was calling the other person if they didn't have the quote-unquote business records of that person calling. And that device that did that was called a pen register. I want to add this before we move on. Now, Stephen Sachs was the, um, the prosecutor on this case for the state of Maryland, and he won the case for the state of Maryland. And uh, a lot of people think, wow, uh, I bet he's really proud of himself. Well, actually, no. He uh, has a quote here. It was a routine robbery case. The circumstances are radically different today. There wasn't anything remotely like a massive surveillance of citizens' phone calls or communications. Uh, to extend it to what we now know as massive surveillance, in my personal view, it's a bridge too far. It certainly wasn't contemplated by those involved in Smith. So he's saying that this is kind of ridiculous. It's a bridge too far. Well, and it, it kind of makes sense if you think about it, because right now with the mass gathering of metadata, it would be like this police force in this specific case that they're citing as an example, went to the phone company and had the phone company install pen register devices on literally every phone in the jurisdiction or every phone in the country as it is now. Yeah, just keep all data because we never know what we're going to need. That's pretty much what it's tantamount to saying. It is a little disturbing, especially given the history of humanity. I mean, when these types of systems have been in place in Stalinist Russia and North Korea, it has not ended well for the people involved. Now, you're saying that this goes farther than just them spying on us. The problem here is that there's no way that we would have gotten here without people inside the organization blowing the whistle long before then, or at least, you know, complaining to congressmen, things like that. And so we did some digging, and it turns out that the NSA, at least specifically the NSA, has had actually some very interesting whistleblowers and people that are uh, sort of calling attention to this sort of activity within these intelligence organizations for more than 10 years. And we haven't heard about them. You know, the, there was the Snowden thing, and everybody heard of Snowden. But there were a lot of people before then, three in particular recently, but even more before that. And so there doesn't seem to be a mechanism for these people to actually blow the whistle and make their voice heard or, you know, raise concerns in any meaningful way. Well, you know, a lot of them on the inside have said, you better toe the line. And there are quotes from several key politicians and individuals that work for the intelligence community saying that they have to toe the line. And we, we're going to get rid of them if they, if they don't toe the line. So that's really what's happened here is that they do not like whistleblowers because whistleblowers do not toe the line and keep to the status quo. Well, the disturbing thing is that you have politicians after the Snowden thing coming out and saying that we need more people inside the NSA that think like we do. And I, I'm not sure that that's good. We, we, you know, 
we're not a, an homogenous society. We need people that can think independently and can think for themselves. And that is what they're saying they don't want any of. Yeah, didn't Socrates talk about this? Oh, I don't know, over a thousand years ago? The Socratic method is more about um, reason and debate. And yeah. reason and debate is not being applied in these situations. It is a purely bureaucratic political process. It is not a, it is not a Socratic process. And part of the Socratic process, we should argue, is um, debate. And you know, taking a position, even taking a position that you don't necessarily agree with, is a good exercise, just in the intellectual exploration of these type of, of things. Perspective. It's, it, it, we have a lack of perspective. Yes, exactly. So you're ready to dive right in and just take a look at it, some specific examples of what's happened um, inside the NSA. So we have two different projects uh, that were developed to collect data. One was called Trailblazer and the other was called ThinThread. Now ThinThread was a very cheap project for the NSA, um, like two or $3 million. These, um, these were both NSA programs designed for collecting information domestically and sorting out information that was of domestic or well not necessarily of domestic origin but some of the data might be domestic origin in order to make sense of it and look for terrorist threats and that sort of thing now thin thread was a, a very small project by the nsa standards and i mean historically the nsa does not like small projects because if you take a look at the of how the nsa actually works the careers are made on gigantic projects and also we cannot forget We've we got to freaking follow the money. I mean, even though I don't really want to because I'm afraid people are going to show up in my bedroom at 2 in the morning. But if we follow the money, we are going to see that it all leads to security contractors. A military, The military-industrial complex in this situation is such that, you know, a 5 or $10 million project, nobody's going to bat an eye at. But when it's a billion-dollar project, that's when you've got a whole line of contractors that are just salivating to get a part of that. And that's what Trailblazer is. Trailblazer was a $1.2 billion project that did almost the same thing, but it was inflated to the point where it created a lot of noise. And that made it more difficult for them to sort the data they were collecting. Does that make sense? Yeah, they were basically vacuum it, vacuuming up so much data they couldn't hope to process it. Whereas some other people inside the NSA had crafted a program that was much smaller that was designed to sort of pre-sort away the data that probably wasn't relevant before it was actually ever collected. So it, when, we, when we were doing the research for this, there are actually four people in the NSA um, that were sort of interrelated and three of them knew each other and three of them worked on the th thin thread project and this stretches all the way back to you know 1998 so this is we're not talking about anything really recent it's there are some recent developments where these people have been persecuted we'll talk about that in a minute but um, they nobody wanted to go with the thin thread project and uh, trailblazer they went with trailblazer and they did that for a few years and then the spending was out of control and the project was off the rails and these people who are more technically competent than they are political, went to the congressional oversight committees and went to the went to the the people that are involved in government waste and fraud and said, "Hey, we're spending a whole bunch of money on Trailblazer and we're not getting anything done." Well, you know, even the people who were against them said they went through the proper channels. Like yes. I haven't seen one report anywhere that said that they went outside of the proper channels, other than the fact uh, that um, um, Thomas Andrews Drake started speaking to the press. But that was after there was a congressional investigation and a congressional report that was published and public the situation like let's fast forward so that was you know we're we're talking 2000 2001 the trail the trailblazer project was canceled i mean the thin thread project was canceled in favor of trailblazer and uh, fast forward to 2006 trailblazer is canceled it's canned it's done away with ineffective doesn't work spending black hole complete insanity and at this point in time hayden was in charge of the nsa um and hayden has done a lot of different things and since then he's gone on to, to graduate from the nsa shall we say but i'll we'll talk about that in just a second now, anyway hayden, what were the quotes um i don't have the direct quote right here but i can find the video but hayden essentially came out and said to the congress um you know all the different reasons why trailblazer was not working and he echoed the whistleblowers his reasons for trailblazer not working were exactly what the whistleblowers were saying five years before five years before and they were all classified as enemies of the state well that's it's being a little overly dramatic let's explain further so what happened is congress was investigating before trailblazer was actually canceled and everybody at least on the nsa director side was like shut up you guys are you know don't talk about this blah blah, blah. black marks in their file 
And so the the three people that were against this, you know, you've heard the names before on the tech, but it was uh, Kirk Wiebe, William Benny, and Ed Loomis. Um, those three people at the NSA, highly technically competent, super intelligent people saying, I, you know, I, we don't know what's going on with this. We, we don't need to do the project this way. We need to do it another way. They were all sort of ejected from the NSA in one way or another. And all of their houses were raided by the FBI for allegedly having, you know, classified material and stuff like that. It was, it was really insane. Yeah, Benny was actually in the shower when it happened and they, bur- they burst into his room while he was in the shower and put a gun to his head. Yeah. I mean, when you see the video of him talking about it, he kind of says it with a smirk, like, yeah, I was just done <laughs> on my head. I'm in the shower naked. And they jump in and pull me out of the shower. Let's talk about Thomas Drake, because he had the worst well, worst, Thomas Drake worst problem of it all. Yeah. Well, Thomas Drake talked to a newspaper after participating in a congressional in a, a congressional investigation into fraud and waste spending. Thomas Drake was part of the minority that favored the thin thread for several reasons, including the theoretical ability to protect privacy while gathering intelligence. Trailblazer, on the other hand, not only violated privacy in violation of the Fourth Amendment and other laws and regulations, it also required billions of dollars. In by 2003, the NSA Inspector General had declared Trailbra- Trailblazer an expensive failure. It cost more than a billion dollars. 2004, the Department of Defense Inspector General produced a final report of its investigation that had been prompted by Rourke and others in 2002. Um, the report basically agreed with assertions that found that there were some serious flaws at the NSA. This case this case was so messed up that in early June, shortly after the May 22nd, 2011, 6 p.m. broadcast of 60 Minutes, an episode of 60 Minutes on the Drake case, the government dropped all the charges against Drake and agreed not to seek any jail time in return for Jake's agreement to, uh, Drake's a- agreement to plead guilty to a misdemeanor charge of misusing agency the agency's computer system. Drake was sentenced to one year of probation and community service. At the July sentencing hearing, pre- presiding judge Richard D. Bennett of the Federal District Court issued harsh words to the government saying that it was unconscionable to charge a defendant with a list of serious crimes that could result in a 35-year prison sentence only to drop all charges at the eve of trial. The judge also rejected the government's request for a large fine, noting that Drake had been financially devastated, losing his $154,600 job at the NSA and his pension. So to sum it up, here's Thomas Drake. He went through proper channels. He blew the whistle. He went to Congress, talked to them. The press gets involved, and like there's a screw up over here, and he's trying to point at the screw up. So they're just like, destroy, destroy. We can't let this get out, and we can't let anybody talk about Thin Thread because it's got to be Trailblazer. We can't even let somebody talk about the wasteful spending in government. You know, he's not towing the line, and so this really is a war on dissent. In this, you know, the legal ramifications for this guy. I mean. He lost his job. He worked as an Apple genius for a while, I think, uh, because he was, you know, basically <laughs> destitute. When you think about this in a whole, you see, like, all these politicians, they jump up on stage and they say things like, we have to do more to protect whistleblowers, and whistleblowers are needed in this country. And every time someone blows a whistle, large or small, uh, or steps out of line just a little bit, they hammer them. They destroy their lives. And If you were Snowden and you were paying attention and you saw what happened to these people... You would probably flee the country. You would probably flee to Hong Kong. Yeah. I I mean, is that really... These are some seriously intelligent people that are obviously on our side and obviously have the best interests of the country and the citizenry at heart. Is this a fair way for the government to treat them? Why are you hearing about this from us? It's a random YouTube channel. It doesn't even make any sense. Random half technology, half whatever else we do, YouTube channel makes no sense everyone should be thinking about this stuff because we were screaming about this before the snowden stuff happened and then all of a sudden the snowden stuff happened like oh my god we thought you guys were tinfoil hat freaks (laughs) at this point we need to cut in the history channel aliens guy (laughs) (laughs) i'll give you guys something there you go that was was for you guys you guys can use it (laughs) so we, we think the problem here is that there are not enough people critically thinking and complaining and sort of uh, going against the status quo. There's not enough debate. Open debate is what democracy is all about. And we're going in the wrong direction. This mentality is trickling down from the high branches of government in Washington, D.C., down into the smaller branches, like the municipal uh, branches, like school, for instance. Zero tolerance policy. You want to talk about that? You take Tylenol to school? That's it. We're calling. We're calling the, the the police. There was a court case today that you know some guy called himself a hacker on a website and he lost all Fourth Amendment rights to because they they got they a, seized his computer. They wanted to seize his computer because on his website he said he likes to hack. He likes to hack. 
what are we going to see? Police raiding hacker spaces all over the, the country? The hacker spaces are now designated terrorist cells. <laughs> they are. They're in there like building robots and doing terrible things and drinking Windex. I don't know. What Zero doing. tolerance policy on CNC mill owners. Is that what we're, is that, is that really what we've become? I mean, you know, the modern definition of hacker, Nikola Tesla or Thomas Edison, though they would be hackers. Yeah, any maker could also be a hacker. The two words are synonymous. It's interchangeable. Um, and if someone thinks that a hacker is dangerous, they don't know what a hacker is. And it's really ridiculous that just if someone self-describes themselves as a hacker, they lose all their Fourth Amendment rights. But that's what we've got. I don't understand how a democracy is supposed to function when the level of government and the level of the citizenry are so far separated that you just you can't even touch anything in government that the average citizen has no hope of making it accessible but politicians have lost touch with with reality and don't understand and fear technology well they've totally confused capability with intent yes like hey these guys know how to build robots or hey these guys know how to write code or hey these guys know how to create something in a chemistry lab they're going to build a robot that has a bomb that hacks into the pentagon and blows it up that's what they think yeah, the Kevin Mitnick that case was of, great. That string of key words is going to get us in trouble. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> if you remember the Kevin Mitnick case from the late 90s, they put him in total isolation because they honestly thought he could call in a nuclear strike from a touchtone telephone. That's, they were wrong. He could have done it from his shoe. That's the level of competence we're looking at here. <laughs> uh, so what's the solution here? I mean, really? Socratic method? What? Yeah, well, I, you know, the Socratic method is really, it's a tool for rational debate. And that's what we've lost. We've lost the ability for rational debate. Everything seems to be predicated on, you know, I hate to, I hate to jump on the military industrial complex bandwagon, but it doesn't seem like the public has the tools to be informed and to have, have a debate. I mean, us doing the research on this was like bamboo shoots under the fingernails. And it's like, I would like to have more well-written journalism on this and there's it's not really out there well i mean and like you just mentioned the military industrial complex if you follow the money it goes straight back to the contractors so we've got to figure out how to separate that from uh the bodies that govern us <laughs> why can't we have like the asteroid mining complex or the space exploration complex really i mean okay contractors out there different military contractors different security contractors listen there's some great asteroids out there they may have uh, well, they, helium. I don't know. Maybe they have. Maybe they got helium on them. Helium got, three. Helium three. Maybe. They, oh my God! You guys could go get that. <gasps> think about it. Golden asteroids. Just think about it. Think about it. Think of all the money. I don't know why we can't have these things. They're such nice things. You guys could go get them. And that's why we're going to Washington D.C. Yeah, we're going to go to Washington D.C. and we're going to encourage you guys to go to the outer space and start putting money into the sciences instead of putting money into blowing everything up and then rebuilding it and then blowing it up and then rebuilding it and then blowing it up and then rebuilding it and then spying on us. <laughs> I really think if we're going to go full tilt military industrial complex, we ought to just raise the countries that we disagree with and then build their infrastructures. It's like, look, we built you some roads and schools and it's really amazing. And no, <laughs> I'm, I'm just being tongue in cheek. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> God, we were in so much trouble after we put this up online. <laughs> I just, it, it makes no sense to me that you can't have a rational debate about things. It, it doesn't, I can't imagine a, a functional society where you can't be informed and debate about things. I mean, at, at, you know, at its highest level, trolling is a form of debate. Well, really, you know, dissent is not up for debate. The game, that is. <laughs> you have to like dissent. I really hate dissent. It makes me motion sick. <laughs> Well, you may have a pass on that. But we were joking around earlier. It's because he gets motion sick from Descent. Oh, He'll never experience just what it's like to play Descent. Multiplayer, that game is ridiculous. Yeah. Mm. We need another game like that. All right, we'll see you in D.C. Yeah, we'll see you guys in D.C.